I'm very excited uh, in, to introduce to you our, our guest preacher this morning. And I want to say hello to those that are watching this right now over at our Mill Creek campus. We're glad that you're with us. And uh, I want to introduce to you uh, Pastor Jay Katanis. I first met Jay at uh, the Converge Conference, our denominational conference, which we held here on this campus earlier this fall. And I was sitting in the back there, and he was up here on a panel of pastors, young pastors, talking about reconciliation and what the church is supposed to be. And I was just struck by his humility, his integrity, his thoughtfulness. And I thought, our people need to hear from this young man. And I asked him, and he said, yes. And so I'm thrilled to, to bring him here and to have him preach to you uh, as we continue on in our series. Jay is uh, a church planter, Garden City Church in, uh, in, in the Jefferson Park area of Chicago. And he's uh, soon to be Dr. Katanis. He just finished part of his comps, and so we're, we're pleased about that. And we'll be uh, excited to see what God does through his ministry. So will you help join me in welcoming Pastor Jay Katanis? Good morning, Chapel Street Church. Thank you for the warm welcome and uh, kind introduction, Pastor Jeff, and for all who welcomed our family here this morning. Uh, we're glad to be here on this very bright and sunny, hot day. <laughs> I should acknowledge um, that I'm here with my wife, Lynn, and our son, Noah. And um, I realize that you've invited me here and you have no idea what kind of preacher that I am. You've trusted me with your pulpit, and I don't know what you're thinking, so <laughs> let's get to it. Actually, when I met Pastor Jeff, we were in one of the rooms over there chatting, and I was preparing to go on stage, and uh, he was talking to me, and I actually was just waiting for him to leave. Be not because I wanted him to leave, we were having a really interesting conversation, but in my mind, I was thinking that he's the host pastor of this conference and pastor of this great church. Shouldn't he be busy doing, you know, lead pastor big church things? And I appreciated so much that he would sit down and have a chat with me, and actually um, that was strangely blessing and, and humbling also for me. So thank you, Pastor Jeff, for your hospitality. Last week, Pastor Jeff preached a sermon called Amazing Grace. I'm also excited that you're going through a series through Ephesians. It's one of my favorite parts of the scripture. And Pastor Jeff talked last week about how amazing God's grace to us in Christ is. If you haven't already heard that sermon, go to the website, check it out, and I'm sure you'll be blessed like I was. But today I want to build on what he said. And as I look at verses 11 through 22 with you this morning, and how they build on verses 1 through 10, I wanted to build my title on what Pastor Jeff's title was as well. And so he talked about God's amazing grace. This morning I want to speak to you from the scripture about how God's grace makes us an amazing race. We are, um, if you're taking notes, this is my big idea this morning. God's grace to us in Jesus Christ makes us a new kind of community. This is a totally new kind of community. That's what you are, that's what we are, and I'm reminded of that when we take communion together this morning, so I feel especially welcome to share with you what Believers and followers of Christ share throughout all time and around the world in all places. It's a totally different kind of community. It's an amazing race. I'll say more about that in a moment. But Paul gives us in these verses three changes. If you will, uh, Ephesians 2.10, with which Pastor Jeff closed last week, said that we are God's workmanship, right? Created in Christ Jesus to do good works, or for good works, which God has prepared for us to do, that we should walk in these works. And so it's actually God's grace that works in us. Three changes Paul talks about from these verses 11 through 22. First, he gives to us a humble memory. Second, a brand new identity. And third, constructive possibility. Humble memory, brand new identity, and constructive possibility. Let's get to the first one as we look at verses 11 through 22, and you can follow along with me on the screen or in your Bibles as I read. Therefore, Paul says, remember 
that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. We get this call and this point uh, that we get a new memory. We get this from the command that starts this section. Paul says, remember. In verse 11, it's there, and it's so strong that in the English translations, we actually have, in English twice, uh, the word remember is there in verse 11 and verse 12, because the translators don't want you to lose the force of this command. Remember, and it's of course tied in with therefore. So in light of everything you just heard Pastor Jeff say from Paul's letter, that it's by grace you've been saved. You didn't do it on your own. You don't deserve it. It's a gift to you. You can't add to it or take away from it. Remember this. Remember the way you lived. Remember where you were. It's as if Paul's saying to the church in Ephesus, in light of everything you heard and how you've been saved, think differently about your past. Who's Paul talking to here? We have to acknowledge this. He's talking specifically to this group of Gentiles, these people who, they came to know Jesus through the preaching of the gospel, but they themselves were not from, you know, a Jewish background. So they were, Paul says, called, supposedly, the uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is just an outward external thing. He's kind of being sarcastic when he reminds them of this is how they were treated because they were on the outside. What does Paul want them and what does he want us to remember specifically? It's that before they heard the good news of Jesus, they were actually separated from God and they had no connection to the blessings known by God's people. That's what they needed to remember. That's what we need to remember too. And John Stott, in his commentary on this, he quotes another commentator, William Hendrickson, saying, uh, to put it simply, before the Gentiles knew Christ, they were these things, Christless, stateless, friendless, hopeless, and godless. Not a very good situation. Probably the kind of thing you don't want to remember. But the call here was to remember just that. They had no chance, just like we had and have no chance, of coming to God and being blessed in all the heavenly places in Christ like he has blessed us without God's help. Divine intervention. Grace. Grace that saves. And this is a huge change for them. As we can see from um, verses 1 through 10, you know, they're needing a reminder, Paul thinks, a humbling. They might be hardworking people. Maybe their church has got it together. Maybe they've come a long way from where they started. But they need a reminder, Paul thinks, twice, that it's only by the grace of God that they're saved. And here, Paul wants them to remember this, but how this works to make them a totally different kind of community. So he gives them this lesson in, on what grace is, right, and isn't. You didn't earn it. It's not a work. You're not being paid by God for what you do. Because he wants them to appreciate, by knowing this, how to properly see their story, their past, their history in a different way now. As I said, we're here with our son, and I would say, you know, anyone who knows me knows that my wife and I could not be prouder of our son. It's crazy. He's, he's like a miracle baby. He, um, you know, we had some challenges in the hospital with him when he was born, and he might actually be the, the cutest baby in the world. <laughs> he might. 
and he's really, really smart. He might be a genius. I think he's a genius. And he even has, he's, he's, he's Filipino and Vietnamese, but he has a patch of blonde hair. He was born with it. People always ask us if we dyed his hair. No, we, don't, we didn't dye an infant's hair, and we don't dye a toddler's hair now. He is just impressive, and we love him so much. But, you know, you should pray for him, though. So I'll ask you, church, you could pray for my son. Because he's so selfish. (laughs) He's so self-centered. Everything is about him. Me, 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 all the time. Um, Once he was old enough to understand that he was sitting in the back of the car rather than up front with us, Whenever he would see my wife and I holding hands, I would hear this from the back seat. No! (laughs) Whenever I put my arm around the back of her chair, right? Not even on her, but on the back of her chair, just as a way of stretching my arm. No! (laughs) And even today, we're we're talking about the church, and I'm telling my wife about uh, my experience the last time I was here. And, you know, um, her, her parents actually live in Aurora, not too far away. So we're just talking, and then he got tired of that because he wasn't part of it, see, and he didn't want to share his mom with me. So this is what we hear often. No, Papa. Talk to me, Mama. Talk to me. Don't talk to my Mama. See, I'm kidding. This is a lighthearted example because if I, you know, as a guest came and told you too hard of a blunt truth, it would be offensive, right? So, but our nature doesn't go away so easily. It takes the grace of God to think beyond ourselves. And one way we can know how self-centered we are is by how we tell our story. It really shows us, or maybe I should say you should ask someone else, not yourself, but ask someone else how it is you talk about your own successes. Who's responsible for them? We don't want to remember things the way that they really were. We like to remember things in a way that makes us sound really great. Paul knows this. This was no less true of the church in Ephesus as it is for me or even a two-year-old. We need to remember the truth, reality, in light of God's grace. We see our own stories, our own pasts differently, humbly now, in reality. And by this, we appreciate the greatness of the grace of God. So I don't know about you, but I'm here today celebrating God's grace to me. When I take those elements at the table, you know, I'm not a pastor, I'm not a church planter, I'm not a PhD student, I'm not any of those things. But I'm a child of God now, who used a punk kid, pastor's kid, insisting on knowing better. Uh, Went to college, became a club DJ. (laughs) Had a great old time until that uh, showed me the less great truth about myself and my great need for God. And through his grace, hey, I belong to him now. And I don't have to be shy about the way I know and tell my story. I can tell it humbly now and differently. And this is a change that is the work of God's grace. A different and humble story. Second, verses 13 through 18. And I think this is kind of the the thrust, the, the main section of these verses. By God's grace in Christ, we have a brand new identity. We have a brand new identity now. Really, now, verse 13 starts like this. But now, Paul says, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made us both one and and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to you who were near. 
For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. We have a brand new identity now. It's different now. Buts, like the one in verse 13 here, buts are big in the Bible. But now, Paul says, in Christ Jesus, it's all different. You thank God our story doesn't end with the way it's talked about in verses 11 and 12. We were characterized by alienation, being separated from God. We were far off. We were away. We were all those things that we said, you know. We were Christless, (laughs) friendless, stateless, hopeless, and godless. But now, turn to your neighbor real quick and tap them to wake them up and say, but now, there you go. But now... The hero enters our story, in comes Jesus Christ. The music changes when he steps on screen, and what he brings in to our lives is peace. Actually, that's who he is. He is peace, our peace. And the peace that Jesus accomplishes for us, it's best captured by this discussion about the image here, the image of the wall the dividing wall of hostility. Most commentators would agree here that Paul is talking about a partition, a wall that exists within the temple itself where there would be a a real wall separating the Jews and the Gentiles. There was a limit to where the the Gentiles could go. And that limit was marked physically by a real wall. Josephus, the famous first century century historian, he talks about this wall. He describes it as as strong and beautiful and impressive, standing about three cubits high, so that's maybe four and a half feet high, with pillars on top, with clear warnings several places throughout the wall, saying that if any Gentile were to go past that wall, they've got only themselves to blame for the impending death sentence. The Gentiles knew they were not welcome beyond that wall. This was a real physical wall. Uh, But we got plenty of walls right now. Interestingly, interestingly, the the wall that Paul is, is talking about here was still standing. At the time when he wrote this letter to the church in Ephesus, was he being prophetic or predicting that it would one day come down? Maybe. Maybe not, I don't know. But the real issue then is that the wall, whether physical and standing or spiritual and invisible, in light of what Jesus Christ has done, it doesn't exist now. For those of us who have received the grace that God gives in Christ, there is no wall. There is no wall now. Whatever wall is there physically is meaningless. Whatever separation and exclusion is expressed by it is broken down. There could be pride and anger from those who build the wall and by that keep other people out. Maybe they're afraid, and in their fear, they're angry. But there can also be jealousy and anger on the part of the people excluded and kept out by the wall. The only way I can think of this is when I take a flight, it's always coach. I never ride first class, but I see how they live. I don't know if you've ever seen how they live, but I get angry. I go, how could they get that? I'm a pastor. I don't know. I could come up with all kinds of things, all kinds of reasons I deserve what they have, and I get mad. And I try to see until, you know, close that thing right in my face. And then I can only imagine. They had hugging dolls up there. (laughs) I can only imagine because I have no choice but to imagine. And the same separation and exclusion that are expressed by the wall are also expressed by the law, the commandments, and the ordinances that come from these laws and commands, especially when they're used in the wrong way. We use scriptures often in divisive and harmful ways. 
was no less true for the people of the Old Testament and the people in Paul's time. And he's saying Jesus has now canceled their dividing power. Game over. How did he do this? Well, I'm glad you asked. When on the cross, Jesus' body is hung up and broken down, so to speak, he bears and takes on himself all the hostility we have against God and each other. And in doing this, he tears down the walls between people of different backgrounds. Just like the actual physical wall between Jews and Gentiles in the temple court would later come down. Where that wall once stood then, where it stood to divide, now Jesus stands. Jesus who died for us on the cross. And he calls together people of different backgrounds. In a whole new way, he creates through himself a new man, a new humanity a whole new people characterized by peace. It's amazing. And at this point, Paul's clear. This gift of peace that God gives to both the Gentiles and the Jews, uh, they both needed it. They all needed it. And so whether they were those like the Gentiles who were to think of themselves as far off, or the Jews who... They thought of themselves as near. Paul saying, whether you were far or near, he came to preach peace to you, and you needed it. You needed him. He is our peace. And this new humanity is actually not comparable to anything in the Old Testament. It's not like the temple. It's not like anything that these groups knew, but um, one commentator, Andrew Lincoln, he, and many others with him, they talk about this new humanity as something totally different. It's a new reality because of the Spirit. It's not a Jewish reality that the Gentiles got to join. Nor is it a Gentile group that, was, that used to be run by Jews. You might have heard me say this, but I, I'm Filipino. And growing up in a Filipino family and church, which was also my family, in a way, right? Um, I grew up with a lot of friends who received from their parents, their Filipino parents, what we call combo names. Now let me explain how this works if you don't know. Combo names work like this. If the father's name was Michael and the mother's name was Arlene, Filipinos might give their child the name Mylene. It's a nice name, right? Uh, the challenge is, is sometimes if the father's name is Bob and the mother's name is Mary, uh, they might call their child Bobbery <laughs> or Bob Mar, which, you know, it's too close to Bob Marley. <laughs> it's unique, I know. Think of it this way, the new humanity that Jesus creates in himself of these groups which were formerly hostile toward each other, but now he makes them live in peace, it was not a, a Jewish or Gentile community. It was not a Juntile community, nor was it Gooish. <laughs> those things are too rooted, those ideas are too rooted in the old humanity. But this was now a whole new way of living. It's not one group running it and then the other group simply accepting how it's run. But Paul's saying it's a new identity. It's a brand new identity. It's a new humanity, an amazing race that's increasingly and altogether different. I want you to think about that and how powerful that can be. We can't help but use our old humanity categories but alive now in Christ, because of his grace and at peace, he's doing a whole new thing, a whole new thing. And everyone is equal at the foot of the cross, totally undeserving like me, but loved in Christ by the Father like me. Whole new thing, a whole new 
way of living together. Third, and finally, God's grace works not just in us, um, you know, a, a whole new memory and way of telling our story and, and a new identity, a brand new way of living together that can't really be captured by all the old ways that we used to live. But also, God's grace fills the church now with constructive possibilities. Verses 19 through 22. So then, Paul says, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by his spirit. In a series of images here, as we look at verse 19 first, Paul's gonna describe the change in a series of images. You know, we can almost feel as we look at the change from image to image how God's grace changes us as people. We go first from strangers and aliens who have no status. They're on the outside. And remember, this was our reality. We go from that to being fellow citizens now. In a sense, where we're naturalized. And we have some political rights, some protection within a state or a nation, and also responsibility, right? But we go from that, from you know, being strangers and aliens to, to being fellow citizens with the saints, to being full-on members of the household of God. Full belonging now in the family. I once heard it said that you know who your real friends are, friends who are really like family, right? Um, there are people who have fridge rights in your house. <laughs> they go to your house. They don't have to ask. They can just go to your fridge, and you're okay with it. That's when you know you're really friends, and they're like family, because family can do that, and now they've moved over, right, from strangers to friends to full-on family, because they got fridge rights. When I heard that, I said, man, as a pastor's kid in an immigrant church growing up and as a pastor now, I must have a lot of friends. <laughs> I must have a big family because everybody's going up in my house doing groceries. This household that God is building out of us, it is both a building and a community, a community where we belong. Its legacy was prepared by the prophets and later expounded by the apostles, but ultimately it's Jesus Christ who is the cornerstone, who holds it all together and in line. For as long as the community stays fixed and true to him and by his grace, he will, he will keep us there. The community can put all its weight into the cornerstone and rely on that piece, that cornerstone, to grow, to hold us up, to help us hold each other up when challenges come. Jesus gives this community structural integrity. You know what integrity is, right? Integrity is when things are integrated. It's not just about being true. It's about being integrated as one. And Jesus has the ability, by his grace, to integrate us. And this is the structural integrity that comes from him being the cornerstone of the church. This new humanity, this kind of community, you could say, is built to last. Then Paul lands on a more explicit image here of the temple. So I want to do a little bit of brief, very brief biblical theology here and trace this theme through the whole biblical story, but I'm going to do it super fast. In the goodness of creation, 
God was fully present to Adam and Eve. And everything that he made, he was present for it perfectly. This was their blessing to know his presence in a perfect way. But their sin led to separation and exclusion, not only from God, but conflict with each other. This is our story too. Remember it. After generations of the Israelites knowing God through powerful experiences while they were on the move, so to speak, David asked God if he could build for God a temple. And God said, I don't need a temple. I don't need a house. But because I want to dwell with you, my people, sure, build me one. His son would later finish it, and God's people experienced powerful things there in the worship at the temple. And yet this turned out to be just a preview for how God would be present and do powerful things through his son, Jesus Christ, the word who became flesh. He called his own body the temple, and he said that if you tore it down, it would rise again in power. Three days after it would be torn down. And he promised that a time would soon come when God would be worshipped not just in one place or building, but actually in spirit and in truth. And Paul would later say that even our own physical bodies by the Spirit are God's temple. And here in Ephesians 2, it turns out that we as a collective body are being built, constructed into a temple. A place where on earth, as a new humanity, the presence of God comes to dwell. That's you. That's us. God is alive and present here, working in powerful ways. And specifically, we are this kind of a community when people of all different backgrounds come together following Jesus. This is a trailer of the eternal life to come when people of all kinds of backgrounds celebrate him forever in his presence. This is why, actually, it's important that we don't claim to be colorblind or to say that we don't see people's differences or downplay their backgrounds or our own. Because the more more diverse our starting points are, actually, the more we see how amazing the grace of Jesus is to bring us all and keep us all together by grace and peace. And we don't have to lose our histories, but Jesus reorders them for us as the cornerstone, putting them in their proper place. You know, I was about seven years old when the Berlin Wall came down. I remember watching the news with my parents, and my mom was in tears. The Berlin Wall, for those of you who don't remember, was built to divide East and West Germany during the Cold War. It stood for almost 30 years. My mom had to strong feelings about it, and she cried because she saw the people celebrating as the wall was being broken down. Because, see, for so long, she had only known that Germany existed with a wall in the middle. But for me, you know, all I knew was mostly in, during my lifetime that there was just one Germany. Think about this wall, though. It didn't come down quickly. Nor did it come down easily. It took struggle. It took time. It took a lot of people coming together. And when it came down, so much changed. I'm not sure if you noticed this. Pastor Jeff talked about his twin brother with the big head. I thought that was me. (laughs) You might not know, but Pastor Jeff and I are not related. Did you not know that? Uh, We kind of look alike. No, we don't. Um, Our communities and our churches are pretty much the same, though, right? I mean, you know, out here in um, Geneva and Batavia and St. George, and me in Chicago. Oh, no, it's totally different. It's totally different. That's right. And our churches are pretty much the same, right? Uh, This church and my church plant, uh, oh, no, it's it's totally, totally different. Actually, up until a couple months ago, we only had five or six people sometimes showing up in my living room. By God's grace, of course, now we're in a Chicago public school, and there's about 40 of us on Sunday mornings. You can pray for us. Um, Hallelujah. We got out of my living room. Um, 
When he invited me out to lunch, though, he introduced me to everyone. He showed me around the church. He showed me all the changes you've made to the buildings here. In order to serve and accommodate more people, changes were made. Um, For the needs of the community, you moved things around and put in the Shepherd's Heart food pantry. And I visited that, and I thought it was amazing. A real mark of God's grace present there. And then he took me over to Mill Creek and I saw where the children were being taught and loved in that preschool there. There's a lot of change there in the building. But for the sake of people who were not otherwise going to be there, changes were made and this was the working of God's grace. Construction, renovation. And then we rode around in his car (laughs) And Pastor Jeff paid for my lunch, amen. <laughs> and I listened to him talk to his wife on the phone. He got in trouble for something. <laughs> Real small. Just like I always get in trouble for stuff. And then we had to go pick up his son, who has the same, same name as my son. And I heard about this, this church that used to be the first Swedish Baptist church of Geneva. And I said, man, I grew up in the Northwest Filipino Baptist Church of Elk Grove Village. But in order to accommodate new people, more people who otherwise would not have been able to come in and know it as their home and as a place where God now dwells in a new way and new people, changes had to be made. It was not easy, but we did it because we knew it was the grace of God. And we were able to connect on so many levels and be pretty comfortable because we shared stories and we actually shared a story of God's grace, working in our lives to take us from where we used to be to where we are now. And it's not over. So I would ask this to you, church. Consider the potential for the greater things that God might do than what you see right here. What might God, by his grace, be building here? One thing is for sure. He is making us a totally different kind of community now. A new way of living a place of peace where he rejoices to dwell. Let's pray. God, we thank you for Jesus Christ, for his grace that changes us, not just me, but changes and makes a whole new us. Thank you. You didn't just leave us where we were, but you make us now into your dwelling place by the Spirit. I pray that this church would continue to experience your grace and in so doing, be known, calling people from all different backgrounds together to follow Jesus in this place where you dwell. This is our prayer in your name. Amen. I love singing that song because it's both a question and a statement. How great is he? We don't yet know. But we declare, how great is he? It was worth the risk to bring you in the pulpit, Pastor Jay. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. I got excited hearing you talk about our church, so thank you. I learned so much, particularly personally. I learned when you said, you know how selfish and proud you are by the way you tell your story. It was good for me to hear. Tell our story to glorify God, not ourselves. And I get excited about our future, and thank you for blessing us. I know that Garden City Church is in good hands, not just because it's in your hands, because it's in the grace of God. So uh, let me leave you with the benediction in just a moment. Before I do that, if you came prepared to give to the Benevolent Fund, I forgot to mention this earlier, ushers will receive that as you leave. And just a reminder, that money goes directly to meet the needs of people in our church and our community who are, who are really hurting. So thank you for those of you who came prepared to give. Now, brothers and sisters, go in the grace of God who is writing a new story in us and in his church. Amen, and go in peace. <laughs>